Craps is a popular casino game played with two dice. The player throws both dice at the same time. If the sum of the values on the dice is 7 or 11, the player immediately wins. If the sum is 2, 3 or 12, the player immediately loses. Any other throw is referred to as the point. If the player rolls a point in the first throw, they must throw again repeatedly until they either win by throwing the point value again or lose by throwing a 7. What is the player's chance to win this game? This problem is taken from the book 50 Challenging Problems in Probability. Take a moment to pause this video and try it out for yourself. Alright, let's move on to the solution. To start off, I want to try to make a diagram to better display the information in this question. Let's start by analyzing the first throw. If we throw a dice pair sum of 7 or 11, we immediately win the game. If our sum is 2, 3 or 12, we immediately lose the game. For any other sum value, we call this the point, and we have the chance to throw again. Now, on our second throw, if our sum is equal to our point value, we immediately win the game. If our sum is equal to 7, we immediately lose the game. Again, for any other value, we throw again. This is repeated infinitely, until we either roll the point value or a 7. Now that we better understand the game, let's try to analyze each of the throws. Let's start by looking at the possible rolls that we can have with two dice. Assuming that both of the dice are fair, we can treat them as two separate discrete random variables who can take values from 1 to 6. Let's represent one of the dice on the vertical axis and another on the horizontal axis. Now, we can try to find the sums that each of these potential roll combinations would make. Looking at these sums reveals a few things to us. Firstly, we see that there are 36 possible outcomes. However, there are not 36 possible sum values. The sums must be bounded by 2 and 12. Another observation you can make is that even though each of these tiles on the grid are equally likely, some sum values are more likely than others. For example, 2 and 12 only occur once in this table, whereas 7 occurs 6 times. To better map out these discrepancies, let's plot a distribution of the frequencies of each of these values. This distribution shows us clearly that 12 and 2 are the least represented and 7 is the most represented. The distribution is a very powerful tool in this question. Since we know that there are 36 possible outcomes, we can simply take the frequency of each individual outcome in the distribution and divide that by the total number of outcomes to get the probability of any individual value. For example, the probability of rolling a 7 in this case is simply 6, the frequency of 7, divided by 36, the total number of possible outcomes. Moving on, let's now model our first throw. The probability that we win in our first throw is simply the probability of 7 plus the probability of 11. This gives us the probability of winning in the first throw as 8 by 36. Similarly, we can compute the probability that we lose in our first throw as the probability of 2 plus 3 plus 12. Adding these up, we get that the probability of losing is 4 by 36. Finally, we can get the probability that we throw a point in our first throw. Since these three situations are mutually exclusive, we can compute this by doing 1 minus the probability of winning plus the probability of losing. This gives us 24 by 36. Now, let's move on to try to analyze the case where we get a point in our first throw and have to move on to the second throw and further. A key insight we can make is that because we have an infinite number of rethrows, if we don't roll a point and win, or roll a 7 and immediately lose, we can simply try again from the second throw onwards. Thus, any roll value other than point or 7 has no actual impact on our winning chances. This means that the probability of winning once we get to the second round is simply the ratio of the probability of rolling our point to the probability of rolling a point plus the probability of 7. Take a moment to pause and ponder why this fact may be true. Alright, so we've got a lot of information now. Let's try to declutter our workspace a little bit and keep only what we need for the next part. We can now try to expand on our key insight. 
Our probability of winning will change depending on what the point value is, since different sums come up with different frequencies. Let's start by looking at a simple example. The probability of winning if our point value was 4. We know that the probability of 4 is 3 by 36. Now, we can divide this by the probability of rolling that point value plus the probability of rolling a 7 in order to get our ratio. This is simply 3 divided by 3 plus 6. We can now follow the same procedure for all the other possible point values. Now that we've computed the probability of winning given each of the individual possible point values, let's try to combine this information. In order to do this, recall that the law of total probability gives us that the probability of winning by throwing a point is equal to the sum over all potential point values of the probability of winning given that a point has a certain value x multiplied by the probability that the point is that value x. Working through the summation is quite a mechanical process, so I'm going to plug in all these values for you. Crunching the numbers, we get that the probability of winning by throwing a point is 0.27. Alright, so we've got a lot of this problem worked out now. Our final step is to finally compute our probability of winning by combining the probabilities that we won in our first throw, plus the probability that we win in any subsequent throw by throwing a point. We've already computed both of these values, and we know that they are mutually exclusive events, so we can simply add them up to get 0.49293. And thus we've done it! We've found the odds of winning at the game of craps. We notice that this probability is almost at 50%. This makes craps possibly one of the best games to play at a casino. However, it still does have a small negative expected value on any given play since this probability is still less than half and so I still wouldn't recommend actually playing this. Another quick follow-up is to try to examine why people feel like craps is a game that favors players more than the casino. This is an interesting look into player psychology. People feel more likely to win than to lose because our first round results often bias our thinking. The first round is often given a lot more fanfare and attention in a casino. And in the first round, as we showed, the probability of winning is actually double the probability of losing. However, if you don't win in the first round and move on to the point stage, the casino's edge increases significantly, and it becomes much more improbable for you to win. Were you able to solve that question correctly? Do you now feel like you have a better grasp of the game of craps? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.